Hello everyone and welcome back to this second part of monitoring water quality of inland lakes using remote sensing. Today's session is going to be on Cyanobacteria Assessment Network or Cyan and we have our guest speakers today Dr. Blake Schaefer from US EPA and Dr. Bridget Seegers from NASA with special guest Daniel Sobota from Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. In the first part, we described state-of-the-art high special and spectral resolution observations from Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, and Sentinel-3 satellites for watch quality remote sensing. We described selected open source in situ measurements of water quality parameters, including those from USGS Water Dashboard and Lake Water Quality Portal. We briefly looked at National Harmonized Chlorophyll Data and United Nations Environmental Protection GEMSTED, and also we looked at GLORIA data. We reviewed algorithm development requirements for remote sensing of water quality parameters, explored and downloaded GLORIA in situ measurements of chlorophyll A concentration, total suspended sediments, and seki depth for Lake Erie. We searched and identified optical surface reflectance data from Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 co-located with in-situ measurements for Lake Erie using Google Earth Engine. Before we start today's session on Cyan, here's a note about asking questions. Uh, please put your questions in the question box and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all of the questions during the Q&A session after the webinar. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the QA document, which will be posted to the training website about a week after the training. So we start today's session on Cyan now. And for that, we introduce our speakers. Uh, Dr. Blake Schaefer is currently with the US Environmental Protection Agency in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. His research focus is on the applied use of satellite and sensor remote sensing technology to monitor water quality in coasts, estuaries, lakes, and reservoirs. His research niche is in the development of applications to meet end-user needs for water quality monitoring and assessment. Dr. Bridget Seegers is the NASA lead on SIGN project with the goal to validate a cyanobacteria algorithm for U.S. inland waters. Although currently focused on freshwater, she is a research scientist in NASA's Ocean Ecology Lab. Her work focuses on harmful algal bloom or HEBs that threaten wildlife, ecosystem, and human health. HEBs are also an economic problem impacting drinking water, tourism, and recreational activities. Before coming to NASA, she researched HEBs off the coast of California on the research cruises and with research robots called gliders. Dr. Sagers is passionate about outreach and education, and she loves being in and on the water as a surfer and sailor. So here we have Drs. Schaefer and Sagers. Uh, please take it away. This is the NASA RSET training for monitoring water quality of inland lakes using remote sensing, part two on the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network. Hey Blake, happy summertime. These long hot days of summer make me super excited to get out to the lake. Looking forward to doing some cannonballs, getting in a swim, tossing the dock lines, going out for a sail. Finding a canoe or a kayak, something to paddle, maybe dusting off the old wakeboard and doing some tricks. There's so many ways to enjoy the water. And we have a long weekend coming up. What about you? Any plans? Yeah, for sure. Um, we're hoping to get some fishing in first thing in the morning before the crowds arrive. Otherwise, um, we intend to have a relaxing weekend. You know, the family probably go for a hike, bring the dog at our local state park that surrounds a lake, and then we'll find a place to grill some burgers, maybe let the kids swim for a bit. Nice. Yeah, lakes are important to our everyday lives, even though we're not thinking about them all the time. People really love going to lakes, getting in or playing on the water, relaxing, enjoying the views. And all these visits can also be great for local economies. One study of a rural Oklahoma lake estimated that visitors to the lake added $1.78 million 
to the surrounding community and supported about 50 local jobs. Just think about all these visitors coming, they're buying gas and food, other supplies like sunscreen and fishing gear and worms. Actually, I don't really want to imagine over a million dollars worth of worms, but the point is lakes are really important for the recreation and for the economy. Indeed, fishing is an important use of lakes. Lakes provide food for consumption. Just think of all that yummy fish, mm, catfish. We'll also um, use our lakes for our drinking, our bathing, and irrigation of crops. But I really want to put the importance of this unique freshwater source in context. This freshwater that we consume, recreate, and use for a variety of purposes out of all the water on Earth, only 2.5% of it is freshwater. And of that 2.5%, only 1.2% is surface freshwater, like found in our surface lakes. And that's really hard to imagine. So I'd like to put it in context another way. There are nearly 8 billion people on Earth, and the world's surface freshwater amount is equal to only 4 million of those people, or roughly the equivalent of the number of people living in just Houston, Texas. Wow. Freshwater is really rare, and it's such an essential resource. Clean water brings people together. It's something that people agree is important. Yet, there's a variety of concerns that threaten water quality and all the wonderful things we enjoy about freshwater in lakes and rivers and reservoirs. Today, we're going to focus on one particular threat that has foul odors and is potentially toxic to aquatic wildlife, people, and the pets we love. Is this some subtle way of you complaining about my socks again? <laughs> no, no, Blake. This is actually much bigger than the threat from your socks. We're talking about cyanobacteria. These microscopic organisms team up and together they can create toxic conditions that turn the water greenish bluish and even can make a slimy sludgy layer when it's really bad. It almost sounds like a comic book kind of swamp thing character. <laughs> But actually, it's not one swamp monster, but millions of tiny cyanobacteria that multiply and multiply until there are millions and millions of them in one teaspoon of water. And that's what we're here to talk about today. But before we get into the details, welcome to the NASA RSET training, Monitoring Water Quality of Inland Lakes Using Remote Sensing, Part 2 on the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network. I'm Blake Schaefer, a research scientist at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And I'm Bridget Seegers, a research scientist in NASA's Ocean Ecology Lab. Later, we'll be joined by our special guest, Daniel Sabota, uh, from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And today, we're gonna to be talking about cyanobacteria in U.S. lakes and how we can monitor them using satellite technology. So Bridget, please do continue. Tell us, what are cyanobacteria and why should we really care? Right, so cyanobacteria. Let's go back to that lake that everyone was enjoying. That's the one. So cyanobacteria are naturally occurring and they're ecologically important. The cyanobacteria are an essential part of a healthy ecosystem. So we wouldn't want a lake without any cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are important for a couple of reasons. First, they are the base of the food chain. So they feed the fish and a lot of the other aquatic wildlife that we like. Secondly, the cyanobacteria produce oxygen, just like plants on land. However, there's lots and lots of cyanobacteria growth, let's say from too much nutrients in the system. That might cause the cyanobacteria to multiply and multiply to a level that's harmful. We call this harmful situation a harmful algal bloom or a HAB for short. Today we are discuss, discussing harmful algal blooms caused by cyanobacteria, so we call those cyanohabs, which is just a short way of saying cyanobacteria harmful algal bloom. So huge amounts of cyanobacteria can be a, an issue. Too much of a good thing isn't good, and they could form unsightly scums, create odors, and when all these cyanobacteria die, they may actually remove oxygen from the system when they decompose. And this can create low oxygen situations, which can cause fish death. And these cyanohabs can also produce toxins, 
which can cause gastrointestinal issues, um, allergic responses, and other health concerns in people. Dogs, too. Dogs have been reported to die from playing uh, or drinking lake water with these cyanohabs. And these cyanohabs can cause issues for livestock and even prevent our daily consumption of water. In 2014, Ohio issued a do not drink order because toxins from the cyanohabs made it into the drinking water supply. In 2018, there was a similar issue in Oregon, and the list goes on. The issue is these cyanohabs can happen in any lake and potentially any time. And there are a lot of lakes in the United States, and we can't watch all of them all the time for these cyanohabs. Or can we? We're starting to, at least. In 2015, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, NASA, and USGS partnered together to develop the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network. This Cyanobacteria Assessment Network, called Cyan, uses satellite technologies to detect cyanohabs in the largest U.S. freshwater lakes, about 2,200 of them. This network supports federal, state, tribal, and local partners in their monitoring efforts to protect aquatic, animal, and human health. Basically, every day a satellite called Sentinel-3 uses the ocean and land color instrument to detect and help people monitor where and when cyanohabs are occurring in these 2,200 systems. In less than 24 hours, you, that is everyone listening to this training, can access satellite data and see where and when cyanohabs are occurring across the largest U.S. lakes. The Cyanobacteria Assessment Network has put the power of satellite technology right in the hands of the public. Wow, that's super cool. And people might be curious about how the satellites can do that. And in an effort to avoid getting too technical and showing a lot of math equations, real satellites can do this by measuring the changes in spectral color of the lake water. Remember Roy G. Biv? All those colors in the rainbow? Or perhaps that iconic Pink Floyd image from the Dark Side of the Moon album that shows the prison pyramid with a rainbow of colors coming through? Yep, exactly that. All those colors are contained in sunlight, and each color is a different wavelength. When the sunlight hits a body of water, it interacts with the water and the things in the water, like sediment and algae, and this includes the cyanobacteria. Then the light travels back to space where the satellites can measure the light. Since the light returning to the satellite was impacted by what, it, what was in the water, we can use the satellites to estimate things in the water. This means when a beautiful blue majestic lake starts looking more of a bluish green or a cyan color from the cyanobacteria, the satellites can let us know that that's, there's something in the water. Let me show you an example. On the left is what we call a true color image. This is from the satellite and it looks a lot like something you might take with a camera. But then on the right, uh, there's an image, but we took the data from the satellite that measured the different colors uh, or wavelengths of light and put those numbers into a math equation, which then allowed us to estimate the cyanobacteria in the water. And that equation is called the cyanobacteria index. And we can do this for all those larger lakes across the U.S., as indicated in the black outlines in the map below. The brown pixels represent land. And we're gonna give an example. If we zoom in a bit to North, the North Carolina and Virginia border inside the red box there of the map, we're gonna look at Falls Lake in the bottom image. The brown pixels, like I said, represent land. Black pixels where there's a quality flag for one reason or the other, such as cloud cover, or maybe it was too close to land. Gray pixels indicate there was a clear view of the water, but no cyanobacteria were detected. Cooler colors like purple and blue indicate low amounts of cyanobacteria, and warmer colors like yellow and orange indicate higher amounts of cyanobacteria. This does beg the question, Bridget, has all this satellite data been validated, and if so, how? Yeah, good question. It has been validated using information from the states, nonprofits, and federal agencies like advisories, chlorophyll measurements, and toxin measurements across the U.S. It's not a perfect measure of cyanobacteria, and it could be improved, but the validation suggests it correctly captures cyanobacteria events anywhere from 70 to 80% of the time. Full details on all the ins and outs 
of this approach can be found on the SIAM project website and in the NASA release notes. And don't worry, we'll remind you again at the end of this discussion where all those websites are. Okay, okay, but is the data useful? Has anyone been able to do anything with it? Yeah, let me give you a real life example of how the cyanobacteria assessment network uh, satellite data was used to save a community $370,000 for a single HAB event. The study focused on Utah Lake, which is a lake that people like to go for swimming and boating and general recreation. It's beautiful, but it is known for occasionally having cyanohabs. Resources for the Future conducted a study in Utah where cyan satellite imagery successfully identified a bloom that wasn't initially identified through field sampling, which is done by maybe going out on boats and collecting water. So leading up to the 4th of July holiday, local officials were on the lookout for a cyanohab because they didn't want people getting sick. Then just a few weeks before the holiday, the satellite imagery identified the beginnings of a cyanohab as shown on the left. Officials went out, confirmed that there was a cyanohab present, and toxins were also in the water, so an advisory was issued. This advisory cautioned people that there was a cyanohab, maybe they wanted to stay out of the water, and Resources for the Future was able to confirm that the advisory did protect human health and resulted in cost savings uh, related to healthcare. And the image on the right here shows how severe the increase in cyanobacteria were was just before the holiday. And some other states uh, have found the cyanobacteria assessment network to be helpful for their cyanohab monitoring. So to find out more, we had a conversation with Daniel Sabota, who is a senior water quality analyst, analyst at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And here's that discussion. Dan, thanks so much for joining us and sharing your experience. So would you be willing to briefly explain how you're using a cyanobacteria assessment network satellite information in your state of Oregon? Yeah, um, well, thanks Blake and Bridget for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to share uh, our experience using the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network in Oregon. You know, Oregon's been using satellite data from the project for the past four years to detect potentially harmful cyanobacteria blooms in large lakes and reservoirs across the state. We use this information to help guide field sampling by our staff and inform the Oregon Health Authority about potential blooms. We've actually developed a web application to distribute the satellite data to our staff and, and lake managers across the state on a weekly basis. Um, and I want to acknowledge that my colleague Yuan Grun has really done the lion's share of work in developing and maintaining this Oregon specific application. Oh, that's great. It's always fantastic to hear about people using the data. Um, how has the access to satellite technology changed things for your group? Well, you know, the, the satellite technology has really been a game changer in how we can detect and re respond to potential blooms in Oregon. You know, prior to its availability, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality and the Oregon Health Authority relied on piecemeal information reported by lake managers and the public. Using the satellite data to help detect and monitor blooms has really improved coordination among state agencies, federal partners, and lake managers, and how we sample and respond to blooms. Oh, um, could you give a ex specific example uh, or an event that the satellite technology really made a difference? Sure, I'd be happy to give an example. Um, so in the summer of 2020, uh, we provided the Oregon Health Authority with satellite data on a potential bloom at Odell Lake, which is a, prop a popular recreational lake in the Cascade Mountains of Oregon. Uh, the Health Authority was able to issue a preemptive uh, recreational use advisory based on the satellite imagery, and the Department of Environmental Quality was able to send field crews within a few days to sample the lake for cyanotoxins, uh, which were confirmed to be above the state's health advisory levels. Uh, in years prior to the use of satellite data, a recreational use advisory might not have been issued for up to a week after the, the when the bloom was first reported um, due to the lag time of field sampling and laboratory analysis of cyanotoxins. So the, the use of satellite data has really sped up our response time to blooms and improved our ability to protect the public's health. Wow, Dan, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. This was very eye-opening for me. Um, we really appreciate your collaboration at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Thanks again for talking with us. No, no, thanks for having me. And it was uh, great to share the experience we've had using the Sign of Bacteria Assessment Network. Talk to you later. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Some of you may be wondering if this is beneficial for your interests, but maybe you have never used satellite data before. Don't worry, we've got you covered. The Cyanobacteria Assessment Network has gone through great lengths to develop a number of training webinars, software tools, and even easy to use access data formats to save the day. 
If you're interested in digging into this satellite information, the data is simplified into a GeoTIFF. That means you can open the satellite image on your computer or mobile device without any specialized software, just like a picture of a fish caught from, the, from fishing at a lake. You mean like that picture I sent you? I'd love to see some of your fishtail pictures, Blake. Anyway, all the images we're using in this webinar, like the GeoTIFF shown here, are cut and pasted into the presentation, just like any other photos are into slides. Now, if you really want to get your hands dirty, we have different software and tools for data exploration. You can analyze the data using NASA's CDAS uh, software, which is free, and it runs on Macs, Windows, and Linux operating systems. Another option, if you're an ArcGIS or Art Pro user, is a free NOAA Toolbox plugin called RS Tools. Both the CDES software and the RS Tools allow someone to analyze data in a variety of different ways. We're not going to go into details here about these tools because we already have additional training videos available on the Cyan, uh, NASA Cyan website. Uh, so here's a website information about the Cyan product and also the Cyan project itself. Um, so we're going to do a quick exploration of this website and the resources that are available. Um, so again, there's background information, tells you about the sensors, the years that we have data for going back to 2002. There's some maps of the US and also of Alaska. That's where we provide the data for. If you continue to scroll down, you'll see the color bar, that true color imagery, along with the cyanobacteria index imagery and explains what those numbers mean. And then if you're looking at the files themselves, you're going to notice they have very long names. So we have a file naming convention, which is explained here. And then down at the bottom, there's important things like the release notes. So anytime we make a change to the product, we'll put that into the release notes. You can read any updates. Also tells you about the limitations of the product. And then we have the trainings and the tools. So there's a variety of different things available here. We actually have mobile app. Uh, tutorials. We're going to tell you a little bit about that in a bit here in this training. Then we have CDAS training. So that's the free NASA software that you can use to interact with the satellite data. And then finally on this page, you'll see that there's also the RS tools. So if you're again into ArcGIS or uh, Arc Pro, or you can use these tools here. All right. If you're going to be using those tools, you're going to want data. So you go back to the top and you can see there's a box called data access. You can go over there, click on that file search tool. And it'll take you to the data page and it's a pretty uh, short journey to get to your data. So the first thing you want to do is click on some dates. When do you want your data from? Then you're going to check the period. So our typical products are daily and weekly. If you go to the older data, 2002 to 07, it's 14 days because the satellites weren't taking as much data. But typically you choose daily or weekly, so you can pick there. And then which product? So do you want the cyanobacteria index, that estimate of cyanobacteria in the water, or the true color images? So we picked the cyanobacteria index. Then uh, there's different options for downloading the data. Maybe you just want a text file so you can do a bulk download and things like that. That's what those options are about. And then you can click where you want the data for. So maybe you're only looking at one area. Maybe you want to look at the full US. Those options are available. Maybe you're exploring Alaska. Great news there. We got tiles for you too. So you get to pick what you're interested in. Click that. We're doing all the tiles and then you just submit your query and it pops the files up so you can get right into looking at those geotiffs. Um, if you've never used the data before or never gotten data before, they're going to make you sign in to a free account. It's really easy. It just helps NASA keep track of who's using the data. Uh, and then you can start all your own analysis. And that's on that Cyan page that NASA hosts. If you don't have time to dig through all the satellite files or run your own analysis, maybe you're driving around with a canoe on your car or you just want to go jump in a lake. So you simply want to know the conditions of the lakes around you. There is an Android mobile app and a web based app that simply allows you to drop a pin in one of those larger US lakes, select view recent imagery, and you can see the satellite detections of cyanobacteria. Here are some three simple steps to get you going. So step one, you need to download the app. So you need to download the EPA Cyan app. Step two, you find your lake of interest and you tap that location uh, to drop a pin. And then step three, you simply hit view latest image and the app will show you the most recent satellite image. And that's it. 
now we're looking at uh, satellite data from yesterday. It's really cool. You literally have the power of satellite technology in your hands. So this is something you can do at home with an Android phone. Again, you install the app, you find a lake, you tap that location, and then you just click view the latest image and boom, you're looking at the satellite data. Now the app does a lot more than that. You can look at time series, you can th set different thresholds for low, medium and high. You can compare different locations. We don't have time to go into all the details here, but there is a training for this app, which was on the website that I showed you just earlier. So uh, a couple things you want to keep in mind when you're looking at the app. Only the largest lakes are going to show up. So you have to think about maybe like about 10 football fields wide. So all the little, the bigger lakes. And the most frequent question we get is, why does the app sometimes not show the most recent data when you click on it? All right, so the app only shows data when there is a positive report for cyanobacteria. Um, this is a way to save data usage. But if you still want to see the most recent image, you can still click view latest image and you'll get the imagery uh, from the app. If you don't have an Android, but you want to explore the data maybe on an iPhone, a tablet or a laptop, we have something for you too. So take it away, Blake. Yep, we got definitely have you covered. There is a web-based version of the app that has all the same functions of the mobile app and with a few additional bells and whistles. So let's take a look. So here's the main splash page of the web-based version of the app. And it's a little hard to orientate without streets and state lines. So we're gonna click on the map view and I'm going to do something different. Instead of putting in tapping with a pin and putting in a pin, I actually know my coordinates of a specific lake that I'm looking at. So I'm going to enter my latitude and my longitude here for a lake right near us in um, North Carolina. Check the location. So here's uh, where it drops a pin right in the coordinates in Jordan Lake. And I click view latest image. And now we are zoomed in and there is our lake. So you can see um, we can change the transparency. So if you just want to see the imagery or if you really need to see the entire map to navigate around, you can do that. Um, I like to keep it 50% so I can see both the imagery and the map to kind of navigate around. So we're going to do one other thing here. We're just going to show you mentioned changing the threshold. So this is where you do it. You click on that cog wheel and I'm just going to change the lowest threshold from 20, uh, 200,000 up to 400,000 and I'll save it. And this now will update all the numbers and the color coding that I have here. Um, you can see the 300,000 count is now green. Another thing we can do is we can look at water body statistics. So I'm just going to search for Jordan Lake. And we don't want the Jordan Lake in Wisconsin, but we do want Be Ever at Jordan Lake. So you can see the app now draws a polygon around the lake. And this is based on the NHD or National Hydrology Database. And now all of a sudden I can see the full distribution of all the detections of cyanobacteria based on my thresholds um, for that particular image. You can also look at a time series. So look at the previous seven days. And you can see now over time how those divisions of my categories um, changed in the system. In the first two days that you see, there's really there's no information. It's probably because there's cloud cover. Um, and so that information is not available. The other thing we can do is we can upload data that we've um, recorded. So like say we have some field data and I'm going to give an example of this. It's a simple CSV file and it's just your latitude and your longitude and a type either weekly or daily. And there's an example file on the app that you can pull to um, to do this upload and we upload it up to the app. And then what it's going to do is it's going to go through and match all of those points to um, our satellite image that we have that you can pair your values that you've measured as well. And once it's done, you're going to get an email saying the job is complete and this is what the results will look like. So again, it spits back a simple CSV file. You can open it up in Excel or any type of text reader. So it gives it's kind of comes back to you with here are the input locations, both latitude and longitude. There's the location name based on Google Maps. The date that you did the, the information request, the date of the satellite image. Um, and then we identified weekly. We wanted a weekly match. Um, so that's the weekly information. And then it gives you some information. Think about a tic tac toe box, right? So your point is in the center box, uh, the center square of that tic tac toe. And it's looking at nine pixels around that box. 
So that's the information there. So you can do some real quick kind of cool comparisons between your own information and what the satellite's telling you. In addition, if we go back to water body stats and we click on water body reports, you can use a number of different things. You can go by county. Um, so here, just as an example, we're going to go back to North Carolina and you can see it lists all the counties in North Carolina. Um, and for here, we're just as an example, we're going to pick out Chatham Lake. So let's see where is Chatham Lake or uh, not. Sorry, not Chatham Lake, Chatham County. Oh, there we go. Chatham County. And we can select a date just for an example. I think we'll just pick the, the previous week as an example and we can generate the report. So in order to save time here, I'm actually going to pull up another report. Um, this report is not for county, but a specific water body. This will be Lake Okeechobee in Florida. So we're going to download this report. I'm just going to give you an example of what the app is able to do for you. So it generates an entire PDF of, of this report. Um, and so here's some basic information, the legend information, again, the categories that you have selected, the low, medium, high. And we in this demo that I've pulled up, there's one lake, Lake Okeechobee. So it reports that information for that single lake. It gives you the spatial extent and the frequency of the detections of the blooms within that lake. It looks at the pixel distribution, um, both in a pie chart and a graph, and over time for the week. And also it reports it out in a tabular format. So if you wanted to do some of your own more in-depth analysis, you really could. So this app basically kind of does the homework for you. It's, it's a really neat function. Wow, that's some pretty awesome stuff. Um, I'm impressed with all the features. Uh, at one point you mentioned the spatial extent and temporal frequency. And of course the app includes magnitude or concentration, but maybe we should dig into this a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. OK, so often when looking at daily satellite images, one might wonder about the larger context, like how might a lake that you're looking at compare to a lake to other lakes or how are cyanohabs changing from year to year? Yeah, and we've got that information, too. So the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network has worked with amazing people that summarize this type of information at the EPA's EnviroAtlas and report on the environment. So why don't we start by explaining these metrics? The temporal frequency is a conceptual is conceptually represented here. Uh, what this is is a square represents an individual measurement, let's say each week, and we summarize the number of times we have detections of cyanobacteria over the total numbers of observations. So this answers how often do cyanobacteria blooms occur? Right. And the spatial extent is conceptually drawn here, where we quantify the median lake area that is consumed with the bloom and compare that to the total lake area. And this helps answer the question, how much area did these blooms consume? The magnitude is the concentration of the bloom over the year, or perhaps the summer recreational season. So this answers the question, what is the concentration of the blooms? And finally, we have the occurrence, which summarizes out of all the 2,192 lakes that we can provide satellite measures for, how many lakes are experiencing a bloom or not in a particular week. And these metrics are publicly available or soon to be publicly available on a yearly basis at either EPA's report on the environment or EnviroAtlas. Uh, here is the example from EnviroAtlas. And you can see on the left under harmful algal blooms, the temporal frequency and spatial ex extent are available for each year that Cyan has satellite data. These measures are available at the individual lake scale in EnviroAtlas. You can see in the middle that Jordan Lake in North Carolina is highlighted. And when you click on the extent, it lists the percentage of the lake area uh, that had a bloom for the year. The EnviroAtlas data are free, uh, to download so you can run your own uh, analysis or do your own investigations. Yep, and let's look at the report on the environment's website. So here's uh, an example of the weekly occurrence for the entire United States for the 2021 calendar year. And we're going to go back, you can see, so this very quickly allows you to go back to 2020, 2019. So you can think, see how things are changing year over year. In Report on the Environment, um, we can also look at the spatial area. 
So again, this is the entire area blooms are consuming uh, the median over uh, the entire United States. And you, what's nice about this is you can also mouse over the plots and see what the actual values are being reported. We can also zoom into specific regions. So here's a brief example, just looking at the Northeast and how that compares for the current year. Frequency, we also mentioned, um, so we can look at this again, how frequency changes year over year. Um, and let's just pick an example. Um, let's pick something different like the West region. So here you can see, uh, and again, you can mouse over uh, the frequency of detections of cyanobacteria across all these 2,192 systems and the number of non-detects um, across each region within the United States. So it's got a lot of different functionality at different scales uh, to allow people to do different types of analysis. Nice. Uh, so here are some cool examples of what you can do with these metrics. Colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. <laughs> On Wisconsin! Go Badgers! Uh, so colleagues at the University of Wisconsin-Madison used the frequency metric and built a model with Zillow home sale information and found that lakefront housing, uh, the prices of these houses would benefit from less frequent cyanobacteria blooms. For example, a northeastern regional annual benefit would uh, <laughs> a regional benefit would equal more than fourteen million dollars just from a sing just from a single week of a reduction in blooms. So again, if we just reduce blooms by one week, it's equivalent to fourteen million dollars in home sale values. Uh, another study used the magnitude metric and developed an approach for identifying lakes at risk for toxins. So we should clarify that the satellites themselves cannot detect toxins, but this effort modeled the risk of toxins using the satellite data. Um, so those are just a few ways to use uh, the data and the cyan metrics, uh, but there are more. Unfortunately, our time together is coming to an end. So in summary, the cyanobacteria assessment network provides near real-time daily measures of cyanobacteria for about 2,200 of the largest U.S. lakes. The data alone is valued at $5.7 million per year. But we don't stop there. No, we don't. The project provides detailed training videos in addition to this event, software tools for technical person uh, who wants to get their hands dirty with the data, and for the person who doesn't have time or, or needs to, just wants to look at the current status. It provides annual metrics of temporal frequency, spatial extent, lake occurrence, and magnitude, all publicly available at the lake scale in EnviroAtlas and regional scales in Report on the Environment. That is a lot of stuff coming from just one project. Indeed, and if you want more information on the project, you can visit the U.S. EPA Cyanobacteria Assessment Network at www.epa.gov slash cyanoproject. There you can find links to everything mentioned in this training, in addition to more than 35 peer-reviewed papers. The NASA Cyan website can be accessed through the EPA site, and it has all the training videos, software, free data, and the necessary background information, such as the release notes, to get you started. This project was funded by NASA Ocean Biology and Biogeochemistry, NASA Applied Sciences, US EPA, NOAA, and the USGS. Sound effects are open source from the BBC. Yeah, and I'm Blake Schaefer at the US EPA. And I'm Bridget Seeger at NASA's Ocean Ecology Lab. And again, special thanks to Daniel Sabota for helping us and providing that interview. Yeah, and thanks to all of you who have interest in our work and made it all the way to the end of this presentation. We hope it was valuable and you learned something new. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and very useful information about Cyan and its applications. We thank our speakers, Dr. Blake Schaefer, Dr. Bridget Sagers, and our special guest, Dr. Daniel Sobota, for their time and information that they provided about Cyan. Next, Dr. Bridget Sagers 
is going to show us a demonstration of Cyan web app and she's going to present a case study. Um, at the end of this presentation, after her uh, case study presentation, you will be going through an exercise using Cyan web app. So let's start with the presentation by Dr. Seegers. Welcome to the Cyan web app. Uh, if you want to come here yourself, you can just go to qed.epa.gov slash Cyan web and it's going to open up to this nice interface. Um, there's only data in the US, so you're gonna wanna stay in that area, stay focused, and you can notice I've been here before because you can see all my pins spread around. Um, all right, so let's take a look at what how this works. We're gonna zoom into Wisconsin where I've done a fair amount of work. Um, you can see it's a satellite image right now. If you prefer street maps, you can do this. Uh, I've got a lot of pins. The color of the pins actually have some meaning. So green means uh, low cyanobacteria, then it goes yellow, orange, and red. So straight away you can get an indication of what's going on in the lakes based on the most recent satellite imagery. If you want to drop a pin in the lake, you can just zoom in and click on a lake and it will put the pin in and it will tell you the most latest imagery, which is January 22nd, 2022. The cells are in the green range, 100,000 cells per mil. And then it tells you how it's changed since the last image. So the previous image was from the 1st of January, and it's gone up a bit from the 50,000 cells that we had then. So that's how you drop a pin. Uh, once you drop a pin anywhere, it's going to automatically put that lake and that location under my location. So let's click over there and see what happens. So I have 27 locations currently. You can scroll down and see them all. Um, if you click on your lake in a location, it's going to give you some additional information. So the first thing that you're going to notice is that the satellite data is now actually on it. So here's Lake Mendota in Wisconsin. And to the right, you can see all the satellite data historically as well. Um, so this is January. There's not much going on in the system. Why don't we go back to um, August and we can zoom in and you can see, yeah, there's plenty of lakes with cyanobacteria in that area. So anywhere you see rainbow colors, that's an indication of cyanobacteria. The gray means it's below detection level and black means there's no data. So that's what things look like in August. And we can go back week to week and see how things have changed. Um, this is the overview feature under my locations. There's also imagery if you want to see all the imagery. You can get all the imagery there. And another cool thing is the charts. So you can see Lake Mendota going back to 2019, um, you know, has some patterns in their cyanobacteria, sometimes big blooms, a lot of background level. It's never really uh, missing any counts or anything like that. But that's another great feature. You can take a look at how the lake has done over time. All right, so another thing you can do if you have your pins dropped around is you can actually click to compare our location. So let's pick like Kaskanag, and then we can go back, let's, let's see, what's another interesting, one? Lake Beulah, whatever, we'll select to compare. So as I click select to compare, they go up into this list of compare. And then once you have your list built, you hit compare locations. So there's a background stats about the most recent conditions but here's a really cool thing, the blooming chart. So you can compare two lakes over time. So you can see Lake Koskinai in this light blue has big blooms and then kind of low background levels and then some really big blooms of cyanobacteria versus Lake Beulah, which kind of has just a low level of cyanobacteria in the lake. So that's kind of neat to see. And then you can also compare their locations on the map. So this is all under the compare tab. Notifications, I'll just tell you when there's new data available. Nothing's going on there now. And then um, uh, the last thing you can do, which is a great feature, is uh, put in coordinates. So if there's a sample location that you do a lot of work at, or maybe you know where there's a swimming beach, you can just put in the Latin long, and then the app will find those lakes and show you the imagery for those lakes. So that's a really brief overview of the Cyan uh, web app. But you can see it's very user friendly. You can find lakes that you're interested in. It will save those locations. You can come back time and time again and see how things are going. Thank you so much, uh, Bridget. That was a great presentation. And we will be working with uh, Web App very soon. So uh, before we do that, just wanted to uh, talk about what's coming up next uh, session. Uh, so we in in part one we already downloaded or at least identified 
um, data in Western Lake Erie region uh, from Gloria, which is in situ measurements. And we also identified uh, images from Landsat and Sentinel, Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. Uh, so now next, in next session, we're going to use those data uh, and we'll use Sentinel-2 because of its higher resolution and the in-situ data and we'll derive, uh, we'll see how to develop algorithm to derive chlorophyll A concentration, uh, total suspended sediments and water clarity. So that's coming up. Uh, we'll also uh, try and look at a variability of water quality parameters over time. So uh, that's coming up. And um, uh, just a reminder about homework and certificates. Uh, homework will be posted on 25th of July on the last day of this uh, training. It will be accessible from our set web page. Um, and it, the answers must be submitted via Google Forms. And the due date is August 8th. So there will be hands-on exercises like you had one in last session and there will be one today so you will be instructed to submit results of these exercises to a google drive folder uh, and certificate of completion can be obtained if you attend all three sessions live and complete the homework assignment by the deadline uh, the certificate uh, will be awarded via email uh, approximately two months after completion of this course so now um, before we go to our question and answer session, we are going to have some time to work on uh, science exercise and you can download uh, that from the meeting page and it's also available from our set website. So uh, we'll have some free time for you to explore uh, science web app and then uh, we'll come back again and do the uh, question and answers. Okay. Thank you. So we have doctors Blake and uh, Schaefer, Blake Schaefer and Bridget Sagers online, and they will be answering all the questions. We've already received several questions, so we will go through them one by one. And Bridget and Blake, please unmute yourself and you can uh, answer the questions. That would be great. Uh, so the first answer, the first question is, can we see the cyanobacteria at uh, coastline or wetlands? Um, sure, I can uh, answer that question. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Bridget Seegers. Um, great to be here. So yeah, in terms of being able to see cyanobacteria at the coast and at the wetlands. So not in wetlands typically because there is land interference and we typically only per, you know, we back off from the land because there can be influences that uh, make the algorithm not perform well. Um, we can detect freshwater cyanobacteria in the coastal est estuaries. Um, the algorithm wasn't meant to detect marine cyanobacteria, but we do provide the product along the coast to the 35 meter isobath. So we, there is some imagery for that re region and people have actually used the cyan product uh, to detect cyanobacteria blooms along the Florida coast and also like the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, and these were blooms that actually came from freshwater systems and then came out of the rivers and along the coast. And um, uh, there is a paper that was published uh, just last month that focused on the movement of cyanobacteria from the freshwater systems into the coast, and they were using the cyan data. So there have been some examples. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, what is the formula for deriving cyanobacteria index, and can it be applied in the case of water hyacinth? Um, okay, yeah, the cyanobacteria index um, is a published algorithm, so it is in a, uh, in a paper, which you can go and read, uh, and it focuses on the, it's based on chlorophyll and also on pigments that are unique to cyanobacteria. Um, this algorithm is not for detecting water hyacinths, so. I wouldn't suggest doing that. <laughs> okay. Question three is, are the distributed images regular geotiff or cloud optimized geotiff? Uh, these images are regular geotiffs. Yep. And question four is, I am based in Ghana, uh, West Africa. Am I able to use the data for the sign app? 
um, you can still access the, the app and use the data, but it's the data on the app is only for the US, unfortunately. Um, there is the source code for the app. It's publicly available. So if anyone wanted to put the resources in and develop the app for any specific region, uh, that that is possible, but it's not part of the app that we are providing. And in the chat, we put the link to the GitHub repository. So that's the that's the code that would be necessary. And I just wanted to ask you, Bridget, that would um, access OG, uh, would Sentinel-3 data be used or any other? Um, right now, with the wavelengths that we're using, uh, OG and uh, Sentinel-3 would be would be the data. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, question six is for Cyan, one of the examples showed uh, exporting summary stats to a CSV file using a point in the surrounding nine points. Is it possible to do a similar a data summary retrieval for an entire lake? Um, yes, uh, lake level stats, they are available in the web app. Um, so you can do that. You'll just have to click around and explore and find that full lake uh, option. And then you can also get like uh, summary stats from the Enviro Atlas. Um, and again, in the chat we put, or in the questions document, we put a link to that um, and how you can maneuver to that area. So there are options to get entire lake stats. Yep. So next question is, can we apply the algorithm with the remote sensing tool in other lakes outside the US? Um, so the RS tools that we provide as part of Cyan, they only work with the, the Cyan GeoTIFF data. So you would have to have the same same Cyan GeoTIFF uh, layout. So I'm not sure that you can, I don't know if you could do that yourself, but yeah, it's not really designed to be used outside the US. Next question is, how long does an event of Cyan bloom normally take? Uh, in a lake. What is the concentration of cyan in milligrams per cubic liter during the bloom event? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, lakes are very, very different and blooms, each one can also be very different. Sometimes blooms might only last a day, sometimes they'll last for weeks or even months. Um, it just depends on you know, the, the system itself and uh, what's driving the bloom and, uh, you know, what will allow that bloom to dissipate. Um, what is the concentration? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I do not have that at the top of my head. <laughs> the minimum resolution, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, I've heard this that at least three to four clear pixels in a lake. So it is limited by sensor resolution. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. So question 10 is, Cyan is a great project service. Uh, why did you decide to base it on Sentinel-3 OG data? Yeah, the choice for using the Sentinel-3 OG data was a combination of things, including the right spectral bands um, that we need for cyanobacteria. So not all the satellites have those same bands that go into the, the algorithm to project to predict the cyanobacteria. Um, then also the spatial resolution, which is 300 meters, um, is kind of in the middle. So a lot of the satellites are like a full kilometer. So the spatial resolution helped us get some more lakes. And then because there's two Sentinel-3 satellites, we get near daily uh, coverage. So that was really good for doing monitoring. Great, thanks. So next question is, what is the best way for validating the results or ground truthing for satellite derived data? Uh, that's a super good question. Um, yeah, so one thing to keep in mind is that also in situ data is like we call it ground truthing, but it also has errors associated with it. Um, so we usually just refer to it as uh, validating, but um, there's no single way that people have come up with a uh, different different approaches to validating, but typically you wanna take some measurements in your body of water at the same time that the satellite is over, uh, going over, and then you can uh, compare what you're measuring in the lake with what the satellite is estimating. Uh, we did in the questions document, put a, li a link to a couple different 
uh, papers that do validation in a slightly different ways. So you can look at different approaches and find out what will work for you. Question 12, is there a significant difference between the West and East concerning cyanobacteria um, blooms? More prevalent in the West than East or vice versa and why? Um, yeah, the way blooms change from one place to another, that's definitely something that's happening. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by West and East, but we have published a couple of papers that look at changes uh, spatially and temporally uh, across regions. So uh, those papers are are in the document, so you can look up how uh, different regions are comparing. Also, we apologize that uh, Dr. Schaefer has not been able to uh, connect with audio because of technical difficulty, but he's online and, and answering some of the questions. Yep, I'm using his words in many cases. <laughs> <laughs> Question 13, is there any plan to make sign available for the rest of the world? That's a really great question. It's such a nice product. It would be nice to provide it uh, globally. And there have been some discussions about making the product global, but currently there, is, there are no set plans for this effort. But again, uh, it is a discussion. Uh, it would require a, a large investment in resources to produce the product, to quality control it, and then to maintain it uh, as a global product. So those are you know, the things that people are considering. The satellite data itself and the algorithms are available. So anyone who's interested could create a cyan product for their own area. And, and that requires in situ measurements or? It, to do the validation, you would um, yeah. need the in situ measurements, which would definitely be a good step. But the satellite data is what goes into the algorithm. So you can recreate the product, but yeah, also validating it would be wise. Uh, question 14, how do I delete unwanted location points under my locations? Um, oh yeah, so if you're working on that web app uh, and you drop some points where you don't want them, you just go back to the main kind of splash page where the map is, and you can click where the unwanted pin is and then it will give you the option to remove that pin. Yeah, I, I, I think if you right click also, you, you have that option, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, right click, okay. Uh, question 15, are there any recommendations for how to track HABs in a smaller lake or reservoir? Um, yeah, well, now with our standard product, because again, we're limited with the Ulchi, the 300 meter, but there are people looking into using Sentinel-2, which is another satellite uh, with a uh, higher resolution, like 10 to 20 meters. Um, it doesn't have all the bands, the wavelengths that we use for the cyan product. So this would probably be a more general, just chlorophyll A product that might give some indication of water quality. Next question is, does the cyan app exclusively apply to lakes and reservoirs in the United States or is it available or suitable for other types of water bodies as well. Additionally, both the size of the water body under investigation have any impact on its uh, applicability with the sign app? Um, yep, yeah, so the sign app provides measurements in the estuaries and uh, the coastal waters out to the 35 meter ISO bath and also in some of the larger rivers. Um, and then in terms of the side, yeah, smaller water bodies that aren't at least three pixels across, though that data is gonna be a little bit less reliable. So it, it's, you know, we have the most confidence in some of the larger lakes. So next question is interesting. It, it says uh, CISINO has this formula, uh, DN uh, 10 to the DN star the coefficients. So is this empirical equation holds true for any region of the world can i use this equation in sentinel 3b data for any lake in india also the dn value of which of the 21 spectral band of sentinel 3a b to be used is there any need for radiometric correction um so that that equation the ci cyano value from the digital numbers that's just for the geotiffs because the geotiffs use digital numbers. Um, so you're just, you know, back calculating to the CI cyano value that came from the algorithm. Um, so 
yeah, it should it should apply everywhere. Um, if you wanted to create, you know, CI cyano value for lakes in India, for example, in theory, yeah, the CI cyano algorithm itself, you know, it's been validated across the U.S. regions. Um, so if you wanted to use it on a more global scale, you know, lakes are a little bit tricky because they're very unique and they can each have their own like optical complexities and that might impact the algorithm performance. So again, if you're going to apply it to a lake in India, you would also want to do some validation to you know understand how well the algorithm works in a certain certain region. Um, the bands that we use for the equation are the Sentinel bands, uh, 620 nanometers, 665, 681 and 709. So th those are the four bands that go into the CI cyano um, algorithm itself. Uh, radiometric correction. We use top of uh, rho s, the top of atmosphere correction, because it's really tricky to do atmospheric correction inland. But you know, people have different approaches. But <laughs> uh, again, I guess it would you'd want to see how well it's performing and go from there. So do you so does it include Rayleigh correction or no correction at all? Uh, just Rayleigh. Mm -hmm. And question 18, what is the need to define water leaving reflectance differently from normal reflectance? Can some algorithm for retrieving water leaving reflectance from sensor measured radiance values be shared for any generic sensor? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, this might be outside my <laughs> area of expertise, unfortunately. Uh, we talked about this last week also, that um, we need water living reflectance um, then just top of atmosphere sometimes because, you know, it takes um, atmospheric effect out. But in this case, like Bridget mentioned, you can use top of atmosphere uh, reflectance but and just do the relic correction because uh, doing like cloud or aerosol or other atmospheric correction might just um, introduce introduce more error. So I guess that's the need, depending on you know how, what kind of signal you're looking at from surface, you may have to do a correction. And that's what water leaving reflectance is, just that you're removing um, what you see from atmosphere, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Question 19, at what level of cells per milliliter does it become dangerous? Um, I would recommend for that to look at, or we would recommend, the World Health Organization has recommendations. Um, more recently, they have switched to using chlorophyll concentration from cell counts, but both are still available, I believe. So I would check out there to see the most recent updates. I know also in the in the U.S., at least, you know, different states might have different guidances, you know, for their own regions and what they consider, uh, you know, a concentration that they need to respond to. Next question is: Is bathymetry known for all included lakes? If not, how do you account for possible bottom reflectance? Um. So. <laughs> This is uh, me speaking for Blake here. This isn't something I know that much about, but modeled mean and uh, max bathymetry is available through various open data sources. For the science project, we typically remove pixels adjacent to land to avoid um, bottom reflectance. And we also apply a quality flag in the processing that limits uh, impacts from um, bottom reflectance. So. We've tried to do some quality control to control for it. Next question is, how does high turbidity affect the occurrence and sensing of cyanobacteria? Um, high turbidity. Um, in terms of impacting the occurrence, I don't know, that could be tricky. <laughs> Because turbidity might block out light, so maybe you wouldn't have blooms, but it also can be an indication of nutrients. So, um, great question. Probably one more worth exploring. Uh, in terms of sensing the cyanobacteria, the algorithm 
in theory is is uh not super sensitive to turbidity but when you get to the highest levels of turbidity it definitely can have some impact on algorithm performance uh, question 22 how does the hyperspectral data set help in the continuous monitoring of cyan bloom yeah that's a great question um hyperspectral data is always nice to have but uh, unfortunately there isn't an operational hyperspectral mission that can be used for real-time monitoring. Um, however, when the hyperspectral data becomes operational available, it would be beneficial, especially in separating cyanobacteria from other types of, of algae. So we're optimistic for it, but we're not there yet in terms of having the data in hand. So question 23, is cyanobacteria concentration enough to comment on water quality? um yeah i'm guessing the question is yeah i mean cyanobacteria concentration is is one aspect of of water quality so if you have a lot of cyanobacteria you know it will tell you potentially that maybe there's toxins or impacts on the water in that way there's obviously many other parts of water quality that you wouldn't be covered by looking at uh you know cyanobacteria concentrations alone the next question is, is there any relation between the, uh, DO and BOD with uh, cyanobacteria index, I think? Um, um, that's a great question. Uh, we haven't looked into this, so hmm. go for it, yeah. <laughs> question 25, is there a way to run a correlation between cyan cell concentration, cell content with other water quality parameters to discover associations between them uh yes yes that could definitely be done um and there are data actually uh publicly available so you can grab all the science data you want and if anyone has these other water quality parameters for sure take a look and see how i know you can discover those associations yeah question 26 can we also mon monitor cyanobacteria development using google earth engine uh, if yes, are there available codes for such analysis? Um, so yes, the Google Earth Engine hosts the Sentinel-3 data, uh, mm -hmm. but we, we don't use that platform as, as part of science. But, also, um, as we there are codes. Bridget, sorry, I interrupted. You were saying something? Oh, no, I, just that the Google Earth Engine does host the Sentinel-3 data, but we don't use that, that platform. So. Question 27, how did you choose to use CI rather than MCI, which is Max Chlorophyll Index or any other indices? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, the CI and the MCI, they're similar approaches. The MCI provides a measurement of chlorophyll, uh, where our focus was on cyanobacteria and not just the chlorophyll. So we went with the cyanobacteria index. Uh, we are considering the MCI for the Sentinel-2 data. Um, so we're still making those decisions. Hmm. Next question, does the presence of aquaculture systems in the lake also affect the development of cyanobacteria? And how do you think the location of the fish cages will affect the special concentration of cyanobacteria? Um, that's a great question. This is something we haven't looked into, but the data is out there, so mm -hmm. someone could be exploring it. Yeah. Next question is, does the presence of cyanobacteria imply the imminent presence of toxins? Um, no, you can have cyanobacteria and not have uh, toxins. Um, and in the question document, there is a link to a, a paper to give some more information on that. So the next question is, do cyanobacteria have any color? How do you identify the concentration? Uh, yeah, cyanobacteria do have color. They have a lot of different pig pigments and that creates the coloring of the cyanobacteria. Um, and then the way we identify the concentration is um, in our algorithm, there, uh, 
this is going to get a little complicated but yeah the algorithm you know the the wavelengths of light are impacted by the amount of um, pigments and cyanobacteria in the system so as the curvature changes uh, it allows us to estimate how much cyanobacteria is present in the system if you're really curious about the how i would pull up one of the, the papers on the cyanobacteria in, <laughs> index itself that was posted above. You can get into all those details. Next question, is there any relation between cyanobacteria and human health in terms of disease incidence? Um, yeah, so exposure to cyanobacteria and the related toxins does have human health consequences. Um, you know, and this includes like uh, rashes, sometimes impacts on respiratory issues. Um, so there, there have been other people working on this. This is beyond my expertise and what we're doing with the, the Scion uh, project itself. But yeah, there definitely is, that's uh, why people are concerned about cyanobacteria. Definitely can cause illness. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Seegers, for answering all the questions, and also Dr. Schaefer, you were typing in, and we really apologize that because of the technical difficulty, we could not um, use audio for you to answer the questions. So, I'm sorry about that. Uh, my pleasure. It was great to see everyone's interest in science and the, the product. We have a few minutes. If you still have any more questions, you can enter them in the questions box. Um, but we want to thank uh, Dr. Blake Schaefer and Dr. Bridget Seegers uh, for today's webinar and information about science. It's been very helpful. Yeah, thank you for having us. Next question is, what is the accuracy of identifying cyanobacteria concentration by this method? Um, that's a fantastic question. Uh, satellite <laughs> data is like far from perfect. So there's definitely uh, um, some uncertainty around the uh, how much, like how accurate it is in terms of the exact concentration. Um, again, we have some papers that have been published. Uh, it depends on where you are on the scale. They tend, the estimations tend to be uh, most confidence in like the mid level. And then, you know, we have some sensitivity issues on the very low level. And sometimes the sensor can it might also depend on which lake you are looking at right like yeah yes, it yeah more. so there's you know it's hard to say exactly mm -hmm. the accuracy um and some of our approaches in terms of accuracy have also looked at um how well does it do in terms of just saying there is a problem or not a problem or low medium and high so it wouldn't be the exact concentration but it still gives you an indication of uh, what's happening in the system and Blake is adding uh, links to some different papers that have uh, discussed this so you can get all the different details again there's one more question is there any relation between cyanobacteria and seasonality of any region yeah that's a great question um, definitely cyanobacteria blooms have some seasonality um, so yeah that definitely they're sensitive to light levels to nutrients to temperature so there's a lot of different things that can uh, drive the blooms um, and many of those variables have a seasonality to them i think the case study you showed that like january february there was nothing much going on and as you move to summer months you could see bloom happening in wisconsin yeah 
yep definitely so i mean many regions consider like their bloom season from late spring until uh kind of mid fall but it's a very you know regionally specific and one thing that we did realize when looking at the satellite data is that uh, you know there are regions that have have winter blooms um you know especially in the south um which at first we weren't sure if that was a real signal or not but indeed it is <laughs> so definitely regionally specific <laughs> the next question is is there any possibility to increase the benefit and world coverage of this program with other researchers in the world by um, institutional collaborations um yeah we're always open to collaboration and definitely one of the if it was going to be produced as a global product we would need these researchers from around the world in particular to help with validation efforts so yeah so were the cyanobacteria concentration estimated based on the surface concentration or was the average estimate at different depths of the lake considered oh that's a great question yeah uh primarily when you're using satellite data you're constrained to to the surface of a body of water um, just because of the way the light interacts with the water. Um, yeah. Great. Oh yeah, and uh, Blake's adding that the depth of the impact is of the estimate would be related to the concentrations. So if you have really, really high concentrations of cyanobacteria, the light's not gonna be able to penetrate very much into the lake. So it's gonna be really constrained to the surface if you have clear water then you know the light can travel a bit further so the next question regarding the quality flag for land adjacency effects or bottom reflectance is there a rule of thumb for estimating a certain number of pixels around the shoreline particularly in smaller lakes like where sentinel 2 would be applied or is there a paper that describes a way to uh, quality flag for bottom reflectance Um, good question. I believe our cyan product moves one pixel, uh, one in full pixel from the shoreline. Um, for the Sentinel-2, that's a, a good question. I do not know the answer if we'll be moving f further from shore or not. Um, and yeah, I'm, maybe Blake can get a paper in there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure of a paper off the top of my head. Oh wait, yep, Blake just added a paper to oh. the the answer. So the next question is: What constitutes an inland lake for a coastal state? How far inland counts? I assume lake like Pontchartrain in Louisiana or Okeechobee in Florida will not work. Are they too brackish, shallow? What what are the parameters? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for us, our inland is to coastal 35 meters in depth. So we do include Lake Pontchartrain and Lake Okeechobee, um, and the those uh, both those lakes, the water quality managers in the area are actively using the Cyan product. So it they it does seem to be performing well in those lakes. So um, yeah, the data is there. Oh, great. So is there any way to integrate citizen science to get more data in the global south? Uh, yes, uh, there, there would be, but we, we haven't done it. But citizen science, you know, definitely, you know, people are very close to these inland bodies of water so it can help with validation um but yeah it's not anything that we've explored with the cyan project yet <laughs> what what is the difference between chlorophyll A and cyanobacteria in water quality. 
Um, so chlorophyll A is an indication of um, algae presence. So it's uh, chlorophyll is a, is a pigment that's found in all the photosynthetic uh, algae that it might be found in a lake. Uh, cyanobacteria, um, you know, we tend to focus on, on those because many of the freshwater harmful algal blooms that occur are, are tied to cyanobacteria. So people are trying to maybe avoid the toxins for recreational reasons or drinking water criteria and things like that. Um, so that is why we have put the focus uh, uh, on cyanobacteria in particular. Um, I think, does that answer the question? What what pigments do your uh, what pigments does your algorithm look for specifically? Is phycocyanin one of them? Yeah, exactly. So the our algorithm is sensitive to chlorophyll and then also just phycocyanin, which would be uh, unique to the cyanobacteria. The question is, why are you concerned about cyanobacteria concentration? Is it that harmful? Um, yeah, so again, the focus on uh, cyanobacteria is uh, different types of cyanobacteria can produce toxins, and these <clears throat> toxins can impact uh, drinking water supplies and recreational activities. And um, so they have you know, big human health and ecosystem consequences along with uh, economic impacts. Um, and so there is a lot of, because of those issues, you know, people are interested in monitoring for these events to hopefully reduce exposure and any harm that might be caused. The next question is, does climate change or extreme weather events exacerbate the increasing case of uh, CB HEBs? Um, yeah, so climate change and extreme weather events, yeah, um, it does seem like warming temperatures, well, people are expecting those to give cyanobacteria a competitive edge, but the results uh, tend to be a, a little bit mixed still. Uh, and in terms of extreme weather events, definitely, uh, you know, rain events and pushing, a lot of times when there's big rain events, it moves nutrients into the system. And those have also been linked to um, cyanobacteria uh, bloom events. So yeah, some of these extreme weathers can definitely change how a system's functioning and can have impacts on, on the HABs that we see. The next question is, since the estimated concentration were estimated from the surface values, does it imply that the result is underestimated? I read that the highest concentration of cyanobacteria may occur at depths ranging from two to nine meters. Um, yeah, that's a great question. We are focused on the surface, but again, this is gonna depend on the system. So different Different lakes are going to have, you know, different types of blooms and some lakes are going to have mixing or um, so, yeah, you, it's just going to be a little bit system dependent. Um, another thing to keep in mind, the satellite only passes once a day around midday um, and that, you know, timing of the overpass also might impact the type of uh, measurements or different aspects of the blooms. Uh, that, that we're seeing. Oh, yeah. Um, I just see what Blake's adding. Uh, one thing to keep with our Cyan product, um, we use a maximum detection um, because it's a monitoring pro product. So if you look at like our seven day product, that pixel value is going to be the maximum value for the past seven days to help ensure that we're not, uh, or to at least do a better job in terms of not underestimating the, the bloom problem. Next question is, if someone were to use drone multispectral imagery to perform a similar remote sensing analysis on water quality, what type of 
connections would be necessary? Oh yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, if you had some uh, imagery and data, you could put that those numbers into the algorithm and get a value. Um, in terms of what corrections would be necessary, yeah, I, I, I do not know. <laughs> but it'd be yeah. fun to explore if someone had that data and the validation data to go with it from the lake itself. What about carbon budget and carbon accounting for cyanobacteria activity? Yeah, that's a great question. The impact of lakes on like global carbon budgets um, is an active debate, uh, but this is something that we haven't we haven't looked into. So. Next question: What kind of cloud mask or haze correction does cyan use? How? Have the recent forest fires and wildfire smoke affected the availability of the product? That's a really great question. There's a lot of discussion right now about uh, wildfire smoke. Um, the smoke does uh, cause a, a loss of detection, so we do lose some data, similar to what the, the clouds do. Um, there is There are quality plagues um, that look for smoke, so we eliminate that data that we think might be impacted. Do you give all lakes the same rating threshold like low, medium, high, or do you have to customize it for different types of lakes? How about quantifying the cell counts from CI? Yeah, those are uh, really great questions. Um, we provide uh, the CI value or the CI cyano value. It, itself. Um, so, at, you know, with our product, we don't put lakes into the low, medium, high uh, categories, but um, an end user could do that. So, if you know, you know, what value seems to be of concern, you can create those relationships. Um, the same thing with cell counts from CI. Um, you can take that value if you have your cell counts, uh, create, you know, create that relationship and create that estimate. But we provide the CI cyano value itself. Uh, we have done some work create, uh, turning CI cyano into a chlorophyll value. So there is an example of that, and we have a paper on that. Um, but cell counts are a little trickier. Yeah, the next question was addressed before about the accuracy of cyanobacteria concentration in the US lakes. Well, we thank once again to our speakers for the time uh, of the information and question and answer session that, I mean, answers that they provided for all the questions. So thank you, uh, Dr. Pritich Seegers and Dr. Dick Schaefer. Uh, our pleasure, yeah, great to be here. There are no more questions. Uh, we would like to thank you all for um, attending this session and also uh, asking such wonderful questions. And again, again and again, we thank our speakers for their time, their effort, and their help with um, the sign training. So our next uh, session will be on 25th of July, next Tuesday, same time. We also want to thank uh, entire RSET team who has helped coordinate this uh, webinar series. Um, so we thank uh, Brock Bevin, Salvin Hudson Odoi, Natasha Johnson Griffin, Jonathan O'Brien, uh, Sue Monty, and of course uh, my colleague Sean McCartney. So from all the sessions, uh, all the exercises you have received for the class time, if you cannot uh, complete those, you, you have time between now and 8th of August uh, to complete everything because the homework will be due then and then you can uh, work on these exercises in, in uh, intervening time.